Owning an electric vehicle is a great way to lower your carbon footprint, lower your monthly fuel costs and insulate yourself from global oil price fluctuations. But it's also a great way to keep things running in a power cut, natural disaster or brownout without relying on fossil fuels, unreliable home backup generators or external battery banks. And today, with temperatures on the rise in the Northern Hemisphere and hurricane season already winding up, not to mention winter temperatures soon coming in the Southern Hemisphere, along with all the issues that can bring to grid stability, I thought today would be a great idea to give you a pointer or two on how to beat power cuts with your EV. Let's do this. One of the coolest things about electric vehicles is that they are like a massive battery pack on wheels. And yes, while that battery pack is used normally to power said wheels, it means that when the power goes out, you've got an alternative power source at home. And so today's video is all about the different ways you can power your home or some select emergency appliances from your electric vehicle if and when that happens. I'm going to cover some of the things that you should grab ahead of that event so you're prepared as well as some tips and tricks to ensure that you don't overload your car or leave yourself stranded. To start, I'm going to go over the different ways you can power things from your electric car. At the hardcore end is vehicle to home or vehicle to grid. In vehicle to grid, your electric car plugs into a specially designed charging station to make it possible to feed power directly to your home and in some places from there to the grid. Vehicle to grid charging stations and vehicle to home charging stations, which are collectively called V to X, either pull alternating current out of your car at the correct voltage for your home to use or more often, they pull direct current out of your car, which in turn is sent through an external inverter to produce the alternating current your home needs. In both cases, not only does your car need to support one of these methods, but your home also needs a dedicated charging station capable of communicating with your car and then properly handling whatever power your vehicle supplies to it. Historically, while DC power takeoff was the preferred method of designing such a system, we are seeing AC systems coming in now. When it comes to DC, it allowed the inverter system required to produce appropriate alternating current from the car's battery pack to live outside of the vehicle, ensuring the vehicle itself didn't add extra weight for everyday driving. And as I said earlier, recently, while some AC based systems are being promised, I don't believe at this time many have hit the market. Those systems rely on cars having pretty powerful onboard two way charging circuits. And while they may ultimately prove more cost effective since they utilize power circuits already in the vehicle to do the heavy lifting, they are still very much in their infancy. Right now, there are only a handful of vehicles capable of V to X. Nissan's LEAF was first, along with other electric and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles with Chidemo inlets that were compliant with the V to X standards released by the Chidemo organization in 2014. Unless you're in Japan, however, where Chidemo is the de facto EV charging standard, support for it is waning in other markets and thus the newest EVs to offer power takeoff using V to X are CCS based. The Ford F-150 Lightning pickup, which is what I have, comes with the capability to power your home and eventually we're told export power to the grid using a specially designed system called the Ford Home Integration System. At the time it was designed and released, however, final specifications for official V to X using CCS hadn't been cemented. So it's technically not 100% compliant with CCS standards for V to X. And if you want to know more on that system and how it's working or not, there are plenty of videos on this channel that I'll link to below. Chevrolet and Ram have also both been promising similar systems for their own monster electric pickup trucks. And for now, the massive battery packs in those vehicles seem to lend themselves quite nicely to the utility of backup power. When it actually works, my home integration system will happily provide up to 9.8 kilowatts of instantaneous power from my truck to my home. And it lets me power my well pumps, my septic system, my heat pumps, and most of the rest of my house as if in fact there wasn't a power cut. 
In fact, there's only a few circuits that aren't connected to my home system. That's the three other level two charging stations we have at the house, our stove and our clothes dryer. Because frankly, if there's a power cut, cooking a roast or drying clothes are likely not at the top of my priority list. Getting any of these systems though takes time, research and money. But let's look at some more immediate and more cost effective ways you can keep things ticking over when the power goes out. Next on my list is the increasingly large number of vehicles coming to market with built in mains power inverters on board, something the industry has termed vehicle to load. Instead of supplying power to an entire house or electrical panel, vehicle to load allows you to pull between one and three kilowatts of power from your car's battery pack using built in mains outlets on the vehicle or in the case of the Hyundai Kia Genesis family of EVs via a special adapter plug that fits into the AC charging inlet on your car. If you're in the market for a new EV and you're wanting something that can provide backup power, this is honestly the easiest solution for getting it. As long as you have a secure place to park your car, because you're going to want to trail cables to wherever it is you want to power, this is the best of both worlds without requiring a massive amount of investment into specialised equipment in your house. Of course, some vehicles also go completely overkill with sockets. My F-150 Lightning, not to mention the Rivian R1T and pretty much every other electric pickup truck on sale or coming to market also offers multiple power sockets in the vehicle cab, front and bed. In the case of my F-150 Lightning, I can even pull a 30 amp, 230 volt feed from the bed to give me around about seven kilowatts of power right there should I need it. And yes, I can use that the same time as I'm using my home integration system. I've checked, it works. In reality though, most people don't have a server room next door and most people don't have everything electric. Most people don't need huge amounts of power and a few kilowatts is more than enough to wait out a storm, especially if you have mains water and sewerage, cable internet connection, and an alternative form of heating that isn't reliant on electricity. To see a good example of this, check out the lovely Alec from Technology Connections who recently demonstrated just how much you can do with the power output from the Hyundai Ioniq 5's vehicle to load system. I've linked to it and I think it's awesome and you should go and watch it. Honestly, if I had mains water and sewerage plus perhaps some cable internet and we didn't have as many random power cuts as we do, I frankly would have opted for this kind of system long before spending a lot of money on the Ford home integration system that I actually have. But while V2L systems come with the car, which means you have to spec your new car with it at the point of purchase, either as an optional extra or a standard fit item on higher trim models, they are certainly the least cumbersome and require no tech savviness to use. So for most people watching this video, that is the path I'm going to recommend if you're not into home attached battery storage systems like Tesla Powerwalls, or you aren't interested in portable backup power systems like the portable units often sold by YouTubers. That said, if you're going this route, as well as the next route I'm going to talk about, you do need to invest in properly rated extension cables. Make sure that the extension cables you're going to buy to use with this are overrated for what you need to do. That means going to your local DIY store and buying a heavy duty, properly rated, properly built electrical cable that is not going to overheat when you pull one kilowatt of power along it. The final solution is of course the DIY one. And for the most part, these can be added to any electric car you can buy today. I am of course talking about DIY high power inverters that attach to your car's 12 volt accessory battery. But in order to take advantage of this, you are going to need to have a secure parking space for your car, as it very often will require you to keep your vehicle powered on and the hood up while the battery backup is operational. It is also more lossy than either of the other solutions I've mentioned as it requires your car's DC to DC converter to run to drop the high voltage of the battery pack down to 12 volts DC nominal for your car's accessory battery and then that is used to power a portable inverter from there. It's also important to consult with owners forums if you're looking to do this as while some electric vehicles will automatically top up the 12 volt accessory battery if it gets low, even if the car is powered off, 
Some don't, so you'll need to know if your car's ignition needs to stay on or not. And while I'm at it, it's also worth checking to make sure that your car doesn't have an auto time off if it's just sitting there with the power on unused. I know the Chevrolet Bolt EV, for example, will turn itself off if it isn't driven for a set period of time, even if the ignition is on to prevent unintended battery drain. So again, you need to do a bit of research to see which cars will happily stay powered on to feed power to the inverter and which ones won't. Otherwise, you might end up flattening your 12 volt battery. Back in 2017, we had a power cut when I lived in a rented townhouse just down the road from where I live now, and our power was out for three or four days. I made a quick trip to a local auto parts store, nabbed a one kilowatt pure sine wave inverter, and I was able to keep our fridge freezer running and essentials running in the house powered by just my Nissan Leaf. It wasn't elegant, but it worked. And there is a very old video on this channel with a much younger me showing how I made it happen. While I'm also at it, the amazing and lovely Ben Nelson, who you should also be subscribed to, video here, recently made a far nicer video showing a quick connect inverter solution he developed for his brand new Chevrolet Bolt EV. So be sure to check that out too. I've linked to it below and you should totally be subscribed to his channel. If you are going with this as an option though, you also need to make sure you buy a high quality inverter that produces an actual pure sine wave. Budget inverters often don't produce clean power outputs, and while that might be fine for running camping gear or maybe some kind of resistive heater from, it won't do nice things to some home appliances like refrigerators, and it most definitely will not play nicely with a lot of computer equipment. The cleaner the output is and the closer it is to mains electricity in its waveform, the better. Finally, and this probably feels like an add-on for your shopping list, in addition to all of those nice, properly rated extension cables. However you choose your backup solution, consider getting a UPS too. That's an uninterruptible power supply, or maybe one or two for your home. I actually have four UPS systems in my home, all connected to computers and servers, and it helps ensure that my computers can gracefully power down if the power goes out for a long period of time. They're also protected against power surges caused during storms. And when my home integration system actually works, they also bridge the gap between the power going out and my Ford home integration system kicking in, which can be a couple of minutes. Did I miss anything? Tell me your backup solutions, the ones that don't rely on fossil fuels, I mean, in the comments below. And on that note, we are done with today's video. If you have comments, drop us a polite note in the Discord chat room, on Mastodon, in the comments below, or if you are a Patreon supporter, you can do it in the comments there. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or a Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Ko-fi, Bitcoin, and Swag store, as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling on my right is a list of amazing Charged Up supporters and shout outs go out to our V2G Patreon supporters. They are Alan Tupper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C, Hey Esker, John Tramal, Kyle Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Ray Jean Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Tazlet in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Carl Hodgson, Chris Asentar, Denny Hyde, Lance Lyle, Linda Irish, Mike Reader and Paul Nelson. And finally, big thanks to our off-grid supporters, Paul Conway, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Hahn, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, Joe Hughes, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. Don't forget that we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday on this channel. Plus over on Sunday, you'll find our chicken and garden updates and also our Sunday musing over on Transport Evolved Take Two. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon. And as always, keep evolving. Yes, it's time for another classic Mac sneaky peek behind the scenes. As I mentioned in another video that I recorded earlier today, yes, I recorded the, the Tesla thing with Ford the same day. I'm sorry, I do that sometimes. This is the same computer that's been 
sat here for a couple of months. I've been busy at the weekend doing garden and other stuff, but I would love to hear from you all about your classic Macs and your classic computers. And I know some of you have wanted to donate classic Macs to the channel to see them behind me on the screen here. If you'd like to do that, just reach out. There is a contact button on our website, or you can reach out to us on Mastodon.